Good morning. Great to see you here for our chapel worship this morning. As we prepare our hearts for our time together, I'll read a quote from G.K. Chesterton. We are perishing for lack of wonder, not for lack of wonders. We certainly live in a wonderful world full of wonders and the wonders of salvation, the wonders of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And so we gather here in this time to worship God and to be prepared for God to reveal to us the wonders of his love and salvation. So let us now worship God together. I invite you to stand for the call to worship. When our personal expectations fail us, when our good intentions do not achieve desired results, Touch our lives with your spirit, 
bringing new life and hope so that we may live and join you, serve you with joy and praise. Out. 
He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably upon his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding countryside. John's disciples reported all of these things to him, so John summoned two of his disciples, sent them to the Lord, and asked, Are you the one who is to come, or should we wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. So he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who is not offended at me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to the things that you would want to speak to us. In your son's name I pray. Amen. How many of you have had things in life that didn't meet up to your expectations? It's not just me, I see. Right? Uh, maybe it was that new movie that was coming out on a favorite book or story. You left the theater slightly underwhelmed, if not utterly disappointed. Or maybe it was that new gadget that they were promoting, you know, this was going to solve everything, a new phone or something, and when it came out, you realized it really wasn't any different than what you had already had. Right? Or maybe it was a vacation you looked forward to. Uh, many years ago, Lori and I had an opportunity to go to a place called the Greenbrier Hotel. Um, I was aware of it because the Greenbrier Hotel that's been in existence since the 1700s um, it's had presidents, dignitaries stay there. Um, it was well known, and particularly it was well known because in the 1950s it housed an underground bunker. So that if the if nuclear war had ever come to America, uh, all of the Congress and the Senate and the President would move to this place in West Virginia, and they had everything set up there. Now the problem is this place is outrageously expensive, and there was no way I was going to go there until one day I happened to see a deal. And it was a deal that seemed too good to resist. If I buy the first night, get the second night half the price, the third night free. I said, great, we can go to this hotel. I really get, I want to see this bunker. So we went there, and when we got to the hotel, I discovered why it was such a discount. The entire front end of the hotel had been ripped off because they were building an underground casino, so we had to go in through the back entrance, right? And then when I finally got to go see the underground bunker, it looked like a giant conference center. Uh, they had camouflaged it very well. So we will never be going back to the Green <laughs> I remember another time, uh, about 20 years ago, when Lori and I had moved to England. Um, I was there to start my PhD, and I was very concerned about the cost of living. Uh, we had lived in Israel before, and during the year that we lived there, um, we pretty much became vegetarians. Because chicken breast, 20 years ago, was $10 a pound. Okay, so yeah, I lived off of a lot of lettuce and pita bread while we were there. So I remember the first day that we showed up in, in England and our landlords decided to give us a town, a, you know, a tour of our little village. And while we were there, lo and behold, we saw all of it. Right? It was like it was like the streams of light were coming down. And I said to her, I said, we are saved. <laughs> we can survive. There's an Aldi here. And so, yeah, we did quite a bit of shopping there. And one day, I remember going into this Aldi there, and they were selling steaks at what I considered to be a reasonable price. And I thought, okay, we haven't had steak in a while. So I brought them home, and on the day when it came time to have the steak, I said, well, you know, take them out, put them on the counter to frost them before I was going to put them on the grill that night. And when I went to go reach them, I picked up the steak. They fell apart in my hands. I mean, into like six or seven different pieces. 
And I'm looking at them, and as, as I'm looking at it, you can tell that these were, if you will, sort of reconstituted sticks. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I looked at the package, and it said, cook from frozen. Yeah, because if you don't, they fall apart. They had literally <laughs> taken and cut out fat that looked like, you know, like that nice shear of fat, you want to say, with pinking shears so that it actually stuck to the meat, and then the meat stuck to the bone. Um, yeah, that was not my best expectation for that dinner. Uh, I will just note that in a land that refers to themselves as the beef eaters, the British do not know how to do beef. <laughs> so expectations, lack of them, or so not being met. In this passage today, John the Baptist is somebody whose expectations are not being met. This is not what he, he was expecting. We start off the story today, Jesus goes to the village of Nain, and Nain is located in the Jezreel Valley on top of this, this hill, and while he is there, he raises the only son of this widow, restores her son to him. And everybody is excited about it, and they say, a great prophet has come among us. And now, this is important that they say this, because this is also the same mountain where Elijah, in the Old Testament, had also raised the son of a woman, in the village of Shunem, just around the hill. And it's not hard for us to imagine that when people were seeing Jesus perform this great miracle, they couldn't help but remember what Elijah had done in times past. And so they're thinking, isn't this wonderful? It's just all like 2 Kings 14. And there are a lot of par parallels here. And yet John, in the midst of this, sends his disciples, right? They, they say to John, this is what's going on. Jesus raised somebody from the dead. And John doesn't seem to be very happy about this. In fact, he's a bit confused. And so he sends messengers to Jesus saying, are you the one that we are expecting? Or is there somebody else? Now we would all say, wow, this is great stuff. What else would you want? Well, let me take you back to the passages that were read in church this Sunday. Because Jesus here talks about Telling John, he says, tell John that the good news is proclaimed to the poor. But John has a very different expectation of what the good news is. In chapter 3 of Luke, John said to the crowds coming to him to be baptized, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not even begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you, the axe, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors can't be baptized. What should we do, teacher? Don't collect any more than you're required. To the soldiers, what should we do? He said, don't extort money, don't accuse people falsely, be content with your pay. People were waiting expectantly and were wondering in their hearts if John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whom sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff from the quenchable fire. And listen to this. And with many words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. The gospel is what that is. John hears about all the great things Jesus is doing, but that's not what John's expecting. John's expecting fire, brimstone, judgment, justice, equality of pay, that people will stop cheating one another, that there will be large-scale sharing taking place. Instead, Jesus is going around casting out demons, healing people, raising the dead. And John is not happy. John is a guy who had the chance to be but at least recognized as Messiah. People wondered. He could have stepped into that role. He probably would have failed eventually, but he had that chance. He deflects it. And he tells them, this is what's coming. And now here he is sitting in prison, sending messengers to Jesus. He's doubting. This is not what we were waiting for. And the answer that Jesus gives to them, to him, is really, in many ways, a non-answer. 
He says to him, he says to him, go tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached them, and blessed is anyone who is not offended at me. Now the word there for offense, is the good Greek word scandalizo, for those of you who were with me on Thursdays at 134, a little shout out for you, uh, which is where we get the English word scandal. It's interesting, John, Jesus' response. Blessed are the one who doesn't stumble over me, who's not scandalized by me, who I'm not offending. Jesus' answer is not very comforting to John. He's sitting in prison. We know what eventually happens to him. And Jesus' answer does not provide John the comfort that he wants. It wasn't what John was expecting. All that John has to look forward to is eventually to lose his life at the hands of a king that is unrighteous and corrupt. And yet Jesus says to him, Blessed are you who are not offended at me, who does not stumble over me. Jesus recognizes that he's not living up to John's expectations, but the statement almost signals to John, God knows better than you do, John. You know, there's often times in life we have expectations of what we expect God to do. What we think is going to happen in life. What we think ministry is going to be like, or even seminary. And then we get here, and it doesn't quite work that way. Sometimes seminary can be a great place to shelter you from real life. You can kind of hide out here. And then you get out into a real setting of ministry, wherever it is that God calls you, and suddenly you're like, I don't like it here. This is not what I read about. This is what I was not preparing for. I want to go back. And those of us that are faculty here can tell you how many times we have students visit us. I just want to come back. Life is so much more easier. This wasn't what I was expecting. Not what I was looking for. I remember when I entered seminary, the very first month that I was in seminary, getting ready to go through four years of grad school, and I was only in my first week of classes, and I got a phone call from my dad, who was diagnosed with cancer. And so during those four years, as I was on a track to try and complete my degree, I also had in the back of my mind, or really right with me beside, constantly this wondering, would my dad live? Was God going to heal me? Would he see me finish the course, graduate? And at times, life, like John the Baptist, just doesn't seem to be fair. And there's things about it we just simply don't understand. And like John the Baptist, we start questioning, why do I feel like I'm being cheated? I think about passages that make me struggle. I think about the blind man in John chapters 5 and 9. The disciples say, why is he born blind? Was it his sin or his parents? And I don't like Jesus' answer. Neither. He was born blind for the glory of God. If I was the blind man, I have, I have some words for God. You made me blind <laughs> to do a cool party trick? Right? Watch that. You know what I mean? Because that's how I feel. Yet, nonetheless, Jesus at times says to us, and blessed is the one who's not scandalized by me, who's not offended at me. I remember reading a newspaper article uh, where a woman in Iran, at the end of an earthquake, the reporter comes up to her, and she's in the middle of the rubble, and she's asking, why would God allow this to happen? The unanswerable question. Not what we're expecting. We go through life thinking we're going in one direction, think we understand God or we understand life, and yet life goes the other way. And the answer that Jesus has for us is, here's the good news, and blessed are you who are not offended at me. My dad passed away February 21st, 1997. I graduated in May. Now we didn't get to see you right anyway. And in reality, I spent a 
quite a few years of trying not to be offended at God. I moved to Israel that summer. They never got to come. And like John the Baptist, we have to hold on to understanding that it's sometimes it's not that our expectations are wrong. It's just not what God had in mind. And sometimes we think we know one thing, but yet God knows another. And the only response that Jesus gives to us is this. Blessed are you who are not offended at me. And in your times in ministry, you're going to encounter things with people, and there aren't going to be any easy answers at all. And the only thing you can do is sit with them, pray with them, and help them not to be offended at God. And if they are, you have to help them work through it. But as Jesus says, and blessed is anyone who does not take offense at me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, but we thank you, Lord, also that you do know better than we do. We thank you that our, even though our expectations are not necessarily unholy or even untrustworthy, yet you do what it is in your heart to do and not in ours. Help us, Lord, to fall completely in our trust to you. And like John the Baptist, even when we question and doubt you, help us, Lord, that we will not be scandalized by you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Bachman, for that. Reminding us that God's ways are not always our ways. But God's ways are always best for us. As we spend some time in prayer now, I invite you, I'm going to invite you to just spend a few moments in silent prayer to lift up your joys, also any concerns and cares that you may have before God, and then I will close. So let's just spend a few moments in silent prayer together. <coughs> I invite you to stand as we close with this final song.
as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Blessed are you who are not offended at him. Go in peace.